just discovered makes him run out the capital entryway, you'll be surprised. In the course of recent months, we have been truly appalled with Paul Ryan and his treatment, or should I say, hate for President Trump. As Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan was not able to work with his own House Republican individuals and declined to work with the President on canceling Obamacare. This ought to have been the simplest bill to go in the House, as Americans are feeling impatient for better health care. Rather, he gave us an awful bill that didn't make it to the floor for a vote. Presently, we're seeing similar issues with regards to imposing change. How about we simply say that America is tired of any semblance of Paul Ryan, and now there is a survey that should drive him to consider leaving Speaker of the House. From Independent Journal Review, while the Trump team is likely toasting to their growing approval, up to 50 percent, one member of the Republican Party will have to put the celebration on hold. According to a Pew Research study, only 29 percent of Americans approve of Speaker of the House Paul Ryan. The dismal approval ratings for Ryan came after he failed to replace the Affordable Care Act, something that Americans blame Ryan for more than they blame President Trump. Two Americans should. Paul Ryan made a total exhibition of himself and totally humiliated the Republican Party. Indeed, even now, the Freedom Caucus has made an extraordinary bill that would repeal and replace Obamacare, most Republicans are ready, however, yet Paul Ryan still can't seem to move the bill into the committee to at last go to the floor. Why? We can just estimate that his self-image is so wounded from his first Obamacare endeavor that he couldn't deal with the way that a superior bill without his name on it is all the more generally welcomed. It's important to note that Ryan's low approval ratings are not just a Republican versus Democrat phenomenon. Ryan is much more disliked than several of his predecessors. According to Time, 75% of Democrats disapprove of Ryan's job performance. Less than half of Democrats minus 49% disapproved of boners, and 61% disapproved of Gingrich's. As for those before Ryan, Time notes, former House Speaker John Boner had a 36% approval rating. House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi, then House Speaker, had a 35% approval rating, and former House Speaker Newt Gingrich scored 43%. Ouch! In the event that your endorsement rating is lower than Nancy Pelosi's, it might be an ideal opportunity to take off. Do you concur? What do you think about this? Do not hesitate and write your thoughts in the comment section below. Thank you for reading. H. T. Independent Journal Judge just drops accusations on Hillary Clinton and forces State Department to release. The entire thing is awfully offensive. We have been subjected to many years of Clinton scandals and allegations of corruption. Therefore, an extremely typical response is encountered what has been called Clinton fatigue. Its side effects incorporate musings of not again at whatever point one of them turns up on TV. These two individuals have slammed themselves down Americans' throats for so long, that for some, simply their appearance is sickening. Would they be able to both truly be such outrageous drama queens? Apparently in this way, and it would seem that we are screwed over thanks to them, mostly because of the mainstream media that for all intents and purposes fall prostrate at their feet. The entire Clinton experience could be transformed into a low-spending B-blood and guts film that would be best appeared on Friday the 13th. Acid neutralizer tablets gave a free ticket. By and by. It would appear that Hillary just made another stride nearer to getting her day in court. Keep in mind the Benghazi tragedy? A government judge has recently requested the State Department to look at email files for messages receptive to Judicial Watch's FOIA claim looking for such messages related to Benghazi. Judicial Watch is persistent in its quest for justice, and plainly Hillary and her partners are straightforwardly in this law office's sights. Judicial Watch announced that on August 8, 2017, D.C. District Court Judge Amit P. Mehta ordered the State Department to search for state.gov email accounts of Huma Abn, Cheryl Mills and Jacob Sullivan, former aides of Hillary Clinton during her tenure as Secretary of State. The State Department is ordered to search in those accounts for records responsive to the Judicial Watch's March 4, 2015, FOIA, Freedom of Information Act request. 
A separate judicial watch for your lawsuit first broke open the Clinton email scandal. Criminals should be indicted regardless of how exhausting or repetitive they may be. What's more, if Hillary ends up having submitted the offenses as charged, at that point she needs her day in court. The issue is this would no uncertainty transform into a media bazaar like the Michael Jackson and O.J. Simpson trials. Other than observing a charged vacation criminal, at last, get justice, it's nothing to anticipate. This judge is not playing amusements, but rather is considering this issue important, which is all the more terrible news for Hillary. Judge Maida described the Judicial Watch's Clinton Benghazi FOIA lawsuit as a far cry from a typical FOIA case. Secretary Clinton used a private email server, located in her home to transmit and receive work-related communications during her tenure as Secretary of State. Further, I, F an email did not involve any state.gov user, the message would have passed through only the Secretary's private server and, therefore, would be beyond the immediate reach of the state. Because of this circumstance, for the sake of ordinary case, the state could not look solely at its own record systems to adequately respond to, judicial watches, demand. The State Department, has not, however, searched the one record system over which it has always had control and that is almost certain to contain some responsive records, state.gov email server. If Secretary Clinton sent an email about Benghazi to Abe, Mills or Sullivan at his or her state.gov email address, or if one of them sent an email to Secretary Clinton using his or her state.gov account, then state's server would presumably have captured and stored such an email. Therefore, the state has the obligation to search its own server for responsive records. That doesn't leave much space for question or for quibble with respect to the State Department. This judge could scarcely be all the plainer. What's more, Keeping in mind that one may charge this is all the after effect of some conservative law office playing governmental issues, that is unmistakably not the situation. Not in any manner. What's more, anybody making such a claim is either uninformed of the realities, outright insensible, or is participating in a program of ponder confusion. Simply observe this this major court ruling can finally result in more answers about the Benghazi scandal and Hillary Clinton's involvement in it, as we approach the fifth anniversary of the attack, said Judicial Watch President Tom Fitton. It is remarkable that we had to fight both the Obama and Trump administrations to break through the State Department's Benghazi stone wall. Why are Secretary Tillerson and Attorney General Sessions wasting taxpayer dollars protecting Hillary Clinton and the Obama administration? Such a great amount of the possibility that Judicial Watch just starts prosecution against those on the left. Such a proposal is crazy. Judicial Watch asked the federal court to compel the Trump State Department to undertake a thorough search of all emails of former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton regarding the terrorist attack on Benghazi, including those of Clinton's closest advisors. Judicial Watch also specifically asked the court to compel the agency to produce all records of communications between Clinton and top aide Jake Sullivan regarding the appearance of Ambassador Susan Rice on NBC's Meet the Press Sunday after the 2012 Benghazi massacre. Thinking back finished Hillary's tenure as Secretary of State, and what we learned amid that terrible period, as well as in the time resulting to it. One's contemplations are attracted to a case that was attempted in 1931 where the litigant put on an air demonstrating he thought he was too huge to be brought to justice. He supposedly sat in the litigant's seat acting presumptuous, apparently lighthearted as the case continued. At that point what was occurring occurred to him. He was not going to beat the rap, and his presumptuous state of mind turned to rage. What's more, with that? Al Capone was condemned to 11 years in federal prison. Hillary has an amenor of arrogance and showcases a disposition that demonstrates she conceives that notwithstanding addressing inquiries of her uprightness is underneath her. Obviously, she has not been prosecuted, not to mention sentenced anything. However, be that as it may, similar to Mr. Capone, her chance may come. The main inquiry is whether the genuine story will be superior to the unavoidable film. What do you think about this? Do not hesitate and write your thoughts in the comment section below. Thank you for reading. H. T. Judicial Watch, Fox News.
look what happens to Shep Smith after he accuses Trump WH of lie after lie. Shepard Smith had an entire inarticulate meltdown on Friday. He was having a speech with Chris Wallace, discussing the Donald Trump, Jr. meeting with the Russian legal counselor and others. He rebuked Trump, Jr. blaming him for more than once lying, not sounding by any means fair and balanced. Via Washington Times, we're still clean on this, Chris, Mr. Smith told his colleague. Why all these lies? Why is it lie after lie after lie? If you're clean, come on clean, he continued. The deception, Chris, is mind-boggling, and there are still people out there who believe we're making it up, and one day they'll realize we're not. Smith has had earlier emotional uncontrolled upheavals on air, yet this one truly ticked off Fox watchers who didn't think Smith was giving Trump, Jr. a reasonable deal. Remark from a man who seems, by all accounts, to be following the news more than Shep is. Democrats had procured Fusion GPS to do opposition research, and they were behind the false dossier on Trump. So abruptly, adventitiously, the Russian lawyer and the Russian-American lobbyist in the meeting were both related with Fusion GPS. Yet, clearly, that fortuitous event is no interest to the MSM or Shep Smith. What do you think about this? Do not hesitate and write your thoughts in the comment section below. Thank you for reading. H. T. Young Con. Rush Limbaugh claimed that the Democrat Party is America's largest hate group. One might say, and as it should be, that the liberal left has gone up against a demeanor of malice, at no other time seen. With each disillusioning loss in an election, the disdain, and vitriol they express simply show the constantly expanding level of distress they feel. At whatever point liberals discuss those on the conservative right, who can't help contradicting them, they utilize terms that one would use to depict the most terrible and underhanded scalawag believable and not a man who just holds an alternate feeling. Conservative radio talk show host Rush Limbaugh mentioned some extremely piercing objective facts about liberals in his Tuesday communicate that may clarify, to an expansive degree, what the liberal left has been not able to perceive about themselves. As related in Breitbart News, on Tuesday, his conservative talker, Rush Limbaugh, pointed out the mood of the Democratic Party, which he described as resentful and unhappy, and noted the liberal comedians are consumed by hatred. This combination of negative emotions according to Limbaugh made the Democratic Party the largest hate group in the country. Partial transcripts as follows, courtesy of RushLimbaugh.com, let me tell you something, folks. There is an inescapable observation and conclusion, and it is this. You have to look very hard, and you have to spend a long time looking, to find a truly happy or content left-wing political person. Whether they're an activist or not. If they re-engaged in any way, shape, manner or form of politics, they re-not happy, no matter what. When they elected Obama, they got angrier. They got more angry. After every success they have, nothing is ever enough. No amount of success makes them happy, every success they have seems to tell them how little they actually did and how much more there is and how deeply resentful of that they are. The bottom line is, you just do not encounter happy, laughing liberals. Even their comedians are consumed by hatred. The Democrat Party has become the largest hate group in this country. Even their comedians are angry and angry and that suffices as comedy. I think it's one of the reasons why left-wing comics have become primary sources of news for other left-wing liberals. So there's never any happiness, there's never any contentment. You do not see any real laughter. You just see a constant level of rage, and I'm telling you, it's not healthy. Talk about sustainable. That cannot be sustained. A healthy mind and heart cannot be sustained by the degree of rage and hatred that we see in the American left today. You have to ask, why do not their successes make them happy? Look at what they've done in the area of marriage. They've totally upended it. They have succeeded in not only redefining a word that has stood for as many years as possible, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of years, that people have been plotting and walking the earth. And even after they succeed with this, they get angry. They do not seem ever satisfied. 
It's the most amazing thing. And we're all paying the price for it, this constant rage, this constant anger. They lose votes, and it's taken as one of the most outrageous things that could happen. Rush has dependably been exceptionally shrewd in scrutinizing what liberals are considering and why they do what they do. Notwithstanding when liberals get their direction, it doesn't make them upbeat, just more resolved to push their disdain down the throats of anybody setting out to differ with them. Now, somebody needs to inquire as to why? For what reason? Democrat lawmakers have whipped their liberal base into a craze so as to win races and when they don't win, at that point viciousness ends up plainly legitimized in their psyches. This mentality can't proceed in light of the fact that the possible outcome will be an America torn into pieces. What do you think about this? Do not hesitate and write your thoughts in the comment section below. Thank you for reading. H. T. Briet Bar President Trump just closed seven major government programs, Deems are furious. Trump budget plan will reduce inefficient spending and get the U.S. debt under control in a matter of 10 years. The plan incorporates cutting taxes and dispensing with those bloated government programs we despise to such an extent. Be that as it may, things being what they are, there was significantly more fat in our legislature than we knew. The organization reported that not just has the administration burned through cash on terrible projects, however, they've kept on burning through cash on programs that have lapsed. The measure of cash being discarded is essentially staggering. Via the Daily Wire, Mick Mulvaney, director of the Office of Management and Budget, announced that the Trump administration has discovered approximately $300 billion in federal spending in programs that have expired. This unauthorized spending has a real impact on balancing the budget. The Trump administration has not yet announced a complete list of programs that are unauthorized, but a quick review of the 2018 budget found 11 programs that Trump is terminating because Congress has not renewed the program for a while. Below are some of the expired programs and agencies and the amounts they spent in recent years. Department of Commerce, Economic Development Administration, $251 million Department of Commerce, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration Grants and Education, $217 million Department of Health and Human Services, Community Services Block Grant, $714 million Department of Homeland Security, Port Security Grants and Transit Security Assistance, approximately $218 million Department of Housing and Urban Development, Choice Neighborhoods, $125 million. Department of Housing and Urban Development, Choice Neighborhoods, this program has spent approximately $150 billion since 1974, without any measurable impact Department of Housing and Urban Development, Indian Community Development Block Grant, $60 million, the rundown continues endlessly. These projects have lapsed, with Congress declining to restore them. However, money was all the while streaming into them with everybody looking the other way. Large portions of these projects have not been demonstrated to try and be successful. In any case, your cash would finance them, in any case. That is the way our administration's been working for a considerable length of time. Zero responsibility. Zero outcomes. Maybe now, with a genuine leader in the White House, this sort of bloated spending will be conveyed to an end. What do you think about this? Do not hesitate and write your thoughts in the comment section below. Thank you for reading. H. T. Patriot Journal